and 325C um, in response to the divide of the Christian populace? Like, yes, well, that's what the so that's what the Arians say, and those who deny Christ, the Jews would say that too. You know, they try to undermine. But it was the at Trinity. the Council of Nicaea, which was held by the Catholic Church. So how right, was, but but whatever you read uh, was not a Catholic source. They were sources. yeah yeah. Well, sure. You could, oh, you can go out and find people who deny God. You look at people who deny the Trinity. And say that, oh, the, the church invented the Trinity at the Council of Nicaea. Well, no. Uh, Jesus revealed the Trinity to us. Actually, the Trinity was revealed at the beginning of Scripture, chapter 1, when God says, let us make man in our own image. Okay. Right there. And Jesus fully revealed it when he refers to God his Father, himself as the Son, and the Holy Spirit as uh, the one who he will send with the Father after he dies. So, uh, either you believe it or not. So then what was the big deal at the Council of Nicaea? Was? The Council of Nicaea, does anyone know what happened at the Council of Nicaea? Because I, I went over this before. The Council of Nicaea was held because there was a heretic named Arius who was denying that Jesus was the eternal Son of God. He was just a creature. If you hold that Jesus is just a creature, you deny the Trinity. So the church got together because it's, the church was split. Arius was very creative in his arguments, and he heard, had persuaded even some bishops to go along with him. And so Constantine, the emperor, because he saw the kingdom splitting the empire over this issue, he called the council. He said, well, what's the truth? So all the bishops got together. The pope sent his, his legates, and they said, no, God is three. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten eternally, not made, one in substance with the Father. So that's the origin of it. Now, you'll have modern-day deniers of the Trinity, of course, say that the church made up the Trinity in, um, in 325. Well, no. The Trinity is a, is a truth revealed by God from the very beginning. And either you believe it or you don't. You need, to, you need faith to believe in the Trinity. So Jews don't believe it. Aryans don't believe it. Mormons don't believe it. Muslims don't believe it. Okay. So we've got a lot of people that don't believe the truth. We need another one. So uh, this is an apologetics class. Okay. And uh, you know, you listened. Last week, I think it was, or it was the week before, too. Uh, it was actually, it was two weeks ago, to um, a critique of Martin Luther, which was, I think, the best critique ever that I've ever seen, because a former Lutheran went to Luther's very writings and exposed him for, for what his, his beliefs were. And his, I could say, his arrogance and um, you know, exalting his own opinion, uh, you know, he, he criticized the authority of the Pope. The Pope never claimed the authority that, that Luther had. He claimed for himself. You know, everyone must follow Doctor Doctor Luther. Well, anyway, another uh, another issue of of Luther, which all Protestants have gone along with, is the notion that faith alone, as I say up here at the top, Luther's position, sola fide. Like sola scriptura, scriptures alone, no tradition. Okay. Another, the other chief bedrock of Protestantism is sola fide. Faith, it's faith alone, without good works, that is necessary for salvation. You don't need good works. And why not good works? Well, Luther denies free will. If you deny free will, then you can't really say good works because you don't have the free will to choose good works. And the Catholic teaching revealed by God in scripture and tradition is that both faith and good works are needed. I don't really know any modern day Protestants that would deny I mean, the, necessary, the necessity of good works, although they kind of fudge on this. Um, a lot of them have kind of departed from Luther's teaching in practice, at least. Okay, But uh, the, the greatest witness to this, or the most clear and and forceful witness of the necessity of good works to do works of charity to others 
in addition to having faith in God in order to retain salvation, is the epistle of James in the New Testament, which Luther wanted thrown out of the Bible. See, because it was a clear contradiction to what he was saying, faith alone without works is necessary for salvation. And I quote uh, chapter 2 of St. James here, who says, What will it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but not have works? Can the faith save him? And if a brother or a sister be naked and in want of daily food, and one of you say to him, Oh, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, yet do not give them what is necessary for the body, what does it profit? So faith, too, unless it has works, is dead in itself. Show me thy faith without works, and I from my works will show thee my faith. Thou believest that there is God, thou dost well. The devils also believe and tremble. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith also without works is dead. To say, I have faith, that's good enough for salvation. Well, St. James is saying, the devils have faith in God. They've never seen him. But they believe in God. Well, where are they? They're in hell because they did not obey God. And James is saying that if, if you say that, well, I have faith in God, and then you see your brother or sister in need, and you just say, well, have a good day. They're starving, and you leave them on their own and uh, do nothing to help them when you have the means to do so. Well, you ain't going to get to heaven that way. That's what he's saying. So that's the rich man and Lazarus. I mean, Jesus makes this clear in the Gospels. Why does the rich man go to hell? Lazarus is sitting outside his gate. He's starving. The rich man, his dog, is eating the scraps off the table. He wasn't mean to Lazarus. He didn't kick him when he went by him. He didn't spit at him. He just ignored him. So the rich man ends up in hell because he did nothing to help him. And you know, Jesus' words um, from this past Sunday's gospel, by the way, the separation of the sheep from the goats. This past Sunday, we celebrated the feast of Christ the King, Christ's kingship, and a reminder that he's coming as king to judge the living and the dead. And um, at, at his second coming, the dead will rise. Everyone will get a body back. Those who die in God's grace, sanctifying grace, to share in God's life, will receive a body glorified. Purgatory ends at this time, by the way. There's no more purgatory. Christ said, and come, the end of the world. But the dead will rise. Uh, pardon me, those who died in mortal sin, unrepentant mortal sin, will rise too. And uh, there will be a final separation of the sheep and the goats. As St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians this past Sunday, when Christ says, depart from me into the everlasting flames, then, then when he unites all the sheep to him, the goats he casts off, okay, then his church, the mystical body, the kingdom, is complete. And he hands over everything to the Father. That's the consummation of, of all things, the consummation of the church, which is his kingdom on earth, but not perfected yet. It's only perfected at the end. So, but my point here okay, is, what does Jesus say to the goats? Why does he say, depart from me into the everlasting flames? Was it... The ones that were, uh, were they the smarter ones? But they still chose to like, be lost? No, the, the gospel is Sunday. Jesus, it's the separation of the sheep and the goats. And uh, Jesus welcomes those who are sheep. And uh, he says, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was sick and in prison, you visited me. When, Lord, did we do this? When you did it to the, to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Come enter the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he says, you, evildoers, depart from me into the everlasting flames prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you did not give me to eat. I was thirsty, you did not give me to drink. So on and so forth. So they're in hell, cast off from Jesus, not because they didn't believe in God or not because you know, they... they uh, lacked faith, it was because their faith wasn't supported by good works. I mean, you have to do good works. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, you said um, when I was in prison, you visited me. Mm -hmm. So if you like now, if you have a friend who's in prison and you don't visit them, is that considered? Uh, well, you should try to do what you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I mean, mean, would Paul think about it? Well, <laughs> Pauls, Pauls are all right, but uh, visiting someone, being there physically present. Is really what people want because yeah, that's exactly. more or if you don't want to be consoling. I mean, think think about this, okay? If if some friend or relative that you deeply love, okay, comes to town you haven't seen them for 20 years, and they're down the street, are you just going to call them up and say, "Oh, hi, how you doing? Oh, it's nice you're in town. Okay, bye bye." <laughs> no, you well come and come and see me. Okay? Love desires to be in the presence of the beloved. So that's why death is painful because we no longer have these these people, their physical presence among us. But we're united in faith. Yes. You said that um, when Jesus comes, at, like his last coming, um, that the dead will rise too, and then he'll do a final. All death. all who are dead. So is, is he like would people that were in hell like get to come to heaven, or does he just like rub it in like? <laughs> No, everyone who is dead will, will rise with bodies glorified. Those who are in hell are going to get a body to suffer with for eternity. Those who are dying in a state of grace in heaven or in purgatory, purgatory ends, they're at the doorstep of heaven. So, okay. They're going to get a glorified body. Okay. And why is this? Because we are, we're, we're not angels, we're human beings, we're body, soul, composites. We're going to be, we're going to be fully redeemed at the second coming, body and soul. And those who are suffering in hell before Christ's second coming, their suffering will be exacerbated. It will be increased bodily suffering, uh, which will go on for eternity. Because, because our lives were lived in the body, and our good or bad works, whatever we did, were in the body too. One, one, other, one other thing happens at the second coming, I didn't mention, besides the dead will rise and the separation of the sheep and the goats, it's the general judgment. The general judgment, the final judgment. When we die, each of us, what happens at the moment we die? This, the second we die, what happens? Over. Over. What, 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 what happens? What happens? We do, before you go anywhere, before we, we are judged. That's the particular judgment. Is that what purgatory okay? is? Each well, no, that's no, no, no. I'm confused on the whole thing. Okay, so the, we, the particular judgment, okay, we are judged. If we die in a state of grace, we are going to get to heaven, but one may have to atone for more sins in purgatory before one gets to heaven. But what happens immediately after death is that we're judged individually. As long as we die in a state of grace, then we will get to heaven. Purgatory may be a stop for most of us. I'm including myself. I know I haven't lived a life of heroic virtue, that I am not a saint. I am I'm a realist, as I tell people in homilies, and I'm expecting as a realist to go to purgatory. That's why I'm having masses offered for my intention. Okay? So at the moment of death, we're judged. Yes. The particular judgment. Okay? The particular judgment. We're judged. There's a general judgment at the end of time. And there's a general judgment because God and his justice is going to make known, everyone will know who was really good and who was really bad. Because you know, we see people on entertainment tonight and things like this. And, you know, the, uh, the rich and the famous, and you know, because they 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 tried to save the whales, that they, they may be you know they're lauded as being great people. Okay, well maybe in their their private lives they're not leading, leading good lives, and everyone is going to know all the good and all the bad everyone has done at the general judgment. That's God's justice. Everyone will know what everyone has done, and good and bad, everything will be laid out, okay. and. Um, and this is, this is uh, what, what is going to happen right before the final separation of the sheep and the goats. Okay? Yes? I was going to ask, like, I, it was kind of just like a dumb comment, but I, I mean, we're going to know everybody else's like, wrongdoing, so. And good. Like, let's say he stole a piece of pizza, I'm going to know all yesterday. Everyone, everyone will know, and we're, we're, going to see, we're going to see God's mercy in action because, okay, people may have done bad, but they repented. People like St. Augustine, he's going to have all of his sins who, you know, uh, 
we do numbers the same, okay? Everyone will know, but everyone's going to see the good he did and the, the, the heartfelt repentance he made, like the good thief, too, okay, at the cross. Okay? We're going to see his sins, but we're going to see how he made this great act of love and faith in Christ. So, um, this is God's perfect justice. Everyone is going to see what everyone has done, and then there's the separation. Final, yes. Why do we need to know that? Um, because, um, because this is really the fulfillment of justice. It is just that people should know so, who is really good, who is really bad, and and uh, God's mercy in action with the people who have repented of their sins. Okay. We're going to see how God showered mercy upon maybe the greatest sinners and got them back into a state of grace okay, with their free will, because that's that's really the necessary ingredient, whether one is saved or not. It comes down to free will. God gives us a free will. Yes. All right, so I have a question about purgatory. So you say when we're in purgatory. Wait, wait, before purgatory, we're going to get to purgatory a little, a little later. That's on the next topic. But I want to finish my, my sheet here on faith being not only necessary, but good works as well, OK? I ran across this. I was reading over. Um, Pope Leo XIII, who lived about 100 and well, maybe 10 years ago, he died. And um, he was the Pope in the late 1800s. He wrote a whole series of encyclicals on the Rosary. And this was from one of his encyclicals, um, Magne Dei Matris, uh, the Great Mother of God. And um, he happened to speak about uh, the necessity of, of good works to support one's faith. He was quoting James, and he says here, for if, as we all know from scripture, faith without works is dead, as James says, okay, because faith draws its life from charity, and charity flowers forth in a profusion of holy actions. Okay? If you're really um, a faithful person, okay, and you, want to, you, you have charity, well then you're going to act on that charity, okay? Then the Christian will gain nothing for eternal life from his faith unless his life be ordered in accordance with what faith prescribes. What shall it profit, my brethren, if a man say he hath faith but not works? Shall it be able to save him? That's James, which I quoted above. Okay. A man of this sort will incur a much heavier rebuke from Christ the judge than those who are unfortunately ignorant of the Christian faith and its teachings. They, unlike the former, who believe one thing and practice another, okay, I say I'm a Christian, but I don't live it, in other words, okay, um, have some excuse for at least, or at least are less blameworthy because they lack the light of the gospel. So, um, see, by, by being educated in the Catholic faith, uh, we are more accountable before God, because to whom more is given, more is expected. So, yes. I mean, if you're, if you're given more knowledge, okay, I as a priest, I mean, I, 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 I know the faith very well. I know what I should be doing. And uh, so if, if, uh, if priests sin and end up in hell, I mean, that, that many of the saints talk about this, that, uh, oh, they're, they're tortured much more um, um, intensely uh, because they were given much more, and they, they squandered their their inheritance, you could say, okay? So, um, anyway, uh, yes? So. Is hell truly a punishment for someone who's a sadist? Who's, uh, well, I, I think what? someone who's a sadist. No, uh, sad, like, sadist, like, you said that, sure, Satan is too, but, um. No, oh, a sadist, you said. No, I said sadist, like someone would like Okay, well, you could say sadist or sadist, sadist, sadism or sadism, okay. Yes, well, I, I think it is because, um, hey, Sean's? I'm just relaying the question, so we know what you're talking about. Well, well he, he has ears, he can hear. Okay. Well, I, I asked him. Okay. Um, Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I guess that's what I meant. Okay, so, no need to talk. Pay attention. Um, but uh, someone who is a sadist, well, uh, the pains in, in, uh, in hell will be uh, much worse than anyone can ever imagine. 
But the greatest pain in hell is not the pain of sense, which one will have, feeling suffering. It will be the pain of loss, having lost God. That is the primary pain of hell. Because uh, just we use an analogy to make this point. If, if you uh, were injured you know, bodily in some way, uh, compare that to the loss of, uh, say, your mother, father, or brother, sister, uh, whom you love. And that pain strikes us often much worse. And that is the greatest pain that one will have. And those in hell will know for all eternity, there's this, a line in scripture from Jesus, the worm dieth not, the worm of conscience. In hell, those in hell will know for all eternity, all the opportunities that God gave them, races, actual races, little opportunities that he gave to, to help them to make an act of faith in him, to, to be good, and that they rejected this. And they will have to live with that for all eternity, knowing this, and knowing that God for whom they were made, who is our eternal rest and peace, who is our fulfillment, we never have fulfillment in this life, it's only in God, okay? that they have lost that through their own sin. But before I, I want to get on hell right now, I want to talk about the effects of sin. Okay, so if you could hold off. Okay, the effects of sin. This was this was the sheet I handed out uh, last week to you. Okay, please take it out because um, this just makes it easier for me instead of writing things on the board to have you have the present before you have it. I love that. I handed this out last week, yes. Uh, it's called The Effects of Sin, Divine Justice, and the Four Last Things, okay? Um, and um, I'd like you to just turn to the page, turn it horizontally, where it says Divine Justice, because um, this is all linked, you could say, um, hell, purgatory, heaven, um, with with the idea of God's divine justice. Okay? Punishment for sin okay, is two basic categories. Okay? And um, um, let me see. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Before we get there, turn the page over because to go in logical order. Okay. Um, where it says the four last things and uh, moral evil breaking God's law. Okay. On the, the bottom sheet there, breaking God's law, uh, the bottom of the page I should say, um, we have the two um, basic types of sin, or you could say from the beginning, okay? Original sin, which Adam and Eve committed, we didn't commit it, and then actual sin, our sins we commit. When we talk about actual sin, we're talking about sins we committed, and that only begins really at the age of reason. Okay? And we usually say the age of reason is about seven. Sometimes people in custody, especially kids, they say, well, I did something when I was four, I remember. I said, well, you weren't really responsible at four years old. We don't have a, a conscience for them. That's why we don't have kids who are four and three go to confession, because they're too young to grasp things. Okay, The age of reason, okay, Actual sins, sins that are are accountable to us. Okay, we have to answer for those. Um, committed by the individual. Now, two categories of sins, basically. Okay. On on the left hand side, mortal sin. On the right, venial sin. What's a mortal sin? Separate. Mortal sin is a sin that three. There's three conditions to a mortal sin. It has to be serious. Okay. And um, the seriousness has to be understood. We call that sufficient reflection. Okay. I knew it was serious. Okay. And then fully consented to. So when, when I'm uh, explaining this to kids, well, I'll, I'll just go over venial sins. Okay. Venial is usually a slight sin, a sin that's not serious. Or it could be a serious sin that either one didn't know it was serious or it wasn't fully consented to even though it would objectively be a serious sin. And I, 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 I give examples to my little kids when I'm catechizing them on their first confession. Okay? 
go through the commandments, okay? Well, if, um, if uh, uh, the fifth commandment is thou shalt not kill, which also includes doing uh, bodily injury to someone, okay? Harming someone, fighting with someone. Okay? That's included under the fifth commandment, generically speaking, okay? And I say to kids, well, if you got in an argument with your brother or sister over a video game, and you, you shove them, mortal sin or venial sin? They don't think, and they'll say, oh, venial sin, I say, yes. Now, if you get in an argument with someone, and you take a baseball bat and crack them over the head and split their skull open, you think that's a mortal sin or venial sin? So, well, that's a mortal sin, that's serious. Okay? So, theft, the seventh commandment. Um, if you steal a quarter from someone, uh, that's probably a venial sin. If you steal $100, that's probably a mortal sin because that's that's a serious offense. So what if you if you, if you take, however, a dollar from someone who's starving, and that's what they have to live on that day, then that would be a serious sin. The circumstances may be that serious. Depends on the so, value. Well, it, on the it, it it well because of of that need for that person for that money. So the circumstances could change. Okay, but kids usually get this; they understand this. And then I, I, I say my my big one to them. Okay, my, my important one. Um, um, well, if or one of the important ones besides what I just mentioned, I say, well, if if you take a tummy ache on Sunday mornings and stay home to watch cartoons or play video games while your parents are going to church, mortal sin or venial sin? It's a mortal sin. Well, they don't know better though. They're like really young. Like well, well, if they are old enough to make their first confession, they understand this. They understand that if they take a tummy ache to stay home and watch video games, that that this is this is serious matter. Okay? To miss mass on Sunday is a mortal sin. Okay? Doing it knowingly and, and, and willingly. Okay. Yes. Um, so, like, what if you miss mass on Sunday, but you don't even think about it? Like, you don't think in your head, like, oh, it's Sunday church, and then like. What if you, that thought never crosses your mind that it's Sunday? You should go like you thought you forgot it was Sunday. It's every single Sunday, it's like I don't think about it and then I just don't go. Well, no, you're accountable for that. Yeah, because we should we should know it's Sunday. I, well, I know it's Sunday. And, and, I just don't connect going to church. Yeah. Like Sunday in church, I just doesn't connect. With yeah, but we have to because it's God's day. I mean, I, I I gave a homily this Sunday and I preached on this, saying you know if we realize what the Eucharist is. It's the greatest thing that happens on earth, then we should uh, want to be there out of a positive response to God's love for us. Not just because it's a commandment, it is the third commandment. Okay? Keep holy the Sabbath, that's how we do it. And uh, to, to ask one hour out of the week is not uh, unreasonable for God. Okay? But uh, it is the community worship that, that is required of us. Now, sometimes people will confess to me, well, Father, you know, there's a holy day during the week. I, I honestly, you know, I forgot about it. I forgot it was the holy day. And I'll say, well, if you honestly forgot, and you were intending to go, and you just forgot what day it was, like Tuesday or Wednesday, it's out of the norm, well, then that's probably not a mortal sin because it wasn't fully consented to. But, um, you know, some days we just have to know that, you know, this is the day we, it's, it's the Lord's day. We have, to, we have to make time mentally to honor God. God expects this. We're his creatures, so I mean, it's, it's not that big of a, a sacrifice to to uh, go to mass and even have Saturday evening mass. There's even Sunday evening mass. I tell people this. They said, "Well, I was I had to do something on Sunday morning." I said, "Well, you know, at St. Peter's Church, 7 p.m. There's a Sunday mass at St. Anne's Church out by the I. There is a 5:15 mass. There's Saturday evening masses, early Sunday morning. So even if someone works, if someone, um, you know, whatever." You can, you can make it to Mass. Okay. Yes. So God basically put us on this earth to serve Him. So why would He even put us on this earth? If that's all we're going to do is just to serve Him. Well, we serve Him by loving others too. Okay. But in the end, it's, it's for Him. It's all about it's serving Him. Why would He even create us? Well, He created us out of, out of love for us. And he, he, out of His goodness. God is good. He makes us and he, he wants us to share eternal life, eternal happiness with him in heaven forever, never ending happiness. Okay. Now, I want you to think about something because 
we have to have the end in mind in all this. It's heaven. And I don't think people understand and appreciate heaven. Is it kind of just a continuous worship of God? Well, but what, what does that mean? Okay. Now, here, here. Um, imagine, reflect back in your life. If you've seen you know, a beautiful sunrise coming up, okay, or a sunset, or a starry night, and it's just been a breathtaking experience. Wow, this is just so beautiful, this, this experience of nature. Okay. That is fleeting. It comes and goes. God is eternal beauty. He's the good, the true, and the beautiful. And his beauty never fades. We will always be able to see more and more beauty with God because his beauty is infinite. And so everything that we experience on earth, any goodness, any truth, any beauty, we're going to, we're going to be continually, forever, for eternity, satisfied by God who's going to be revealing himself to us. And we're going to have the saints in heaven too. We're going to have the angels in heaven. Think about this. Billions of angels. We're going to get, be able to converse with the angels and, and learn their, their stories, individuals, okay? Uh, we're going to have eternity to do, to do this. I mean, it is really, I think, something that we don't think about enough. If, if you were, another analogy here, okay? If you knew that you were going to go off to a distant land. Okay. I'm going to India next uh, next March. I'm going, to, I'm going to spend a week there teaching Mother Teresa's nuns in Calcutta okay, at the mother house. And they give them a course on the Blessed Virgin Mary. Okay. Uh, but if, 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 imagine if any of us were going off to India for the rest of our lives. Uh, if you want to study about where you're going, like the language, the customs, I think that would be reasonable. So we should, we should want to study and contemplate heaven.